this talk is going to sort of be in two parts. It's called Face Palm, the Joys of Web Speak. But first I want to talk about the fears uh, about what is happening to language in cyberspace, because there's a lot of that about. Um, and a good example was an article that was in the English newspapers last year written by uh, a quite renowned literary journalist and former publisher called Robert McCrum. And uh, he wrote this article complaining about what's happening to English prose in cyberspace. Uh, he said, the English of the World Wide Web is loose, informal, and distressingly dyspeptic. I think he was thinking of all those angry comments under articles on newspaper websites. And uh, apparently, according to him, it has grammatical violations and banality. I mean, the, you know, it, this is like internet language in general. And he talked about the abuse and impoverishment of English online, and even the violence the internet does to the English language. So, I mean, this is quite uh, dyspeptic in, uh, himself, isn't it? You know, he's, he's, he's really angry about something. But what exactly is he angry about? Um, and of course, in earlier ages, people were scared that other things would destroy literacy and destroy the purity of language as we know it. People said that about the advent of television. People said television would stop people reading books. Before that, people said radio would stop people reading books. Because if you can hear someone reading it out on the radio, why would you want to read it yourself? And that didn't happen. And if you go far enough back, Socrates said that literacy itself would make our minds more feeble because if you could write something down and then refer to it later, that meant you didn't need to remember it in the meantime. So writing, according to Socrates, was the elixir of forgetting. Of course, writing itself is a technology. And in 5th century Athens, uh, when Socrates was around, it was a relatively new technology. And people, it seems, are always anxious that a new technology will compete with and so harm older cultural habits that they find valuable. And I think that's where a lot of this fear about the internet and literacy comes from. Um, so literacy you can think of as coming in two parts. There's reading and there's writing. And some people think the internet is harming both. How could it be harming reading? I mean, we all read a lot of stuff on the internet. Well, according to some theories, when we read something on the internet, we're not reading in the right way. It's, it's too easy to skim and read things very quickly and not take things in, instead of reading slowly and deeply. Especially if the article is in the form of a list. You've probably seen the kind of thing on BuzzFeed or other websites, 13 surprising bathroom habits of technology innovators. 23 ways you should definitely not attempt to dance, you know, with GIFs showing all the bad dance moves. And there's a nice new word for an article in the form of a list. Listicle. There are even whole websites containing nothing but listicles, which makes some people fear that the very fabric of written culture is coming apart and that prose is dissolving into a sea of bite-sized list items. I wrote an article about listicles because The Guardian asked me to, and of course I wrote it in the form of a listicle. And I called it, because this is the way you have to headline listicles, I called it Top 9 Things You Need to Know About Listicles. I won't go through all nine here, but one thing I discovered when I was writing this was that a listicle is much easier to write than an article, because you just have to think of each numbered bit, but you don't have to arrange them in any kind of logical order. So it's actually really relaxing to write a, an article like that, and it takes much less time, which is probably why there are so many of them on the internet. So we read a lot of listicles, and we skim everything else, apparently. So some people are worried that the human species is losing its deep reading brain. We, uh, brain plasticity means that, you know, we learn to do things in development and this kind of rewires our brain to kind of have certain skills, but if we no longer grow up deeply reading, then we won't have that brain anymore. This is the worry and this is, uh, this is the claim by a group of writers and neuroscientists who call themselves the slow reading movement. And um, one of these people, uh, Marianne Wolfe, who's a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, there was a report saying that she said, I worry that the superficial way we read during the day is affecting us when we have to read with more in-depth processing. 
And, and the report says, you know, after she spent a day surfing the internet and skimming things and reading her emails, she sat down one evening to try and read a big novel. And she said, I'm, I'm not kidding, I couldn't do it. It was torture getting through the first page. I couldn't force myself to slow down so that I wasn't skimming, picking out key words, organizing my eye movements to generate the most information at the highest speed. I was so disgusted with myself. Which is a sad story. And maybe we've all felt that from time to time. So the fear is now that when we try to read something long and complex, our brains have lost the habit. We can't do it. So our natural response is TLDR, which is a nice little internet shortening of the phrase too long, didn't read. And people often write that as a comment at the end of a very long article, which is, you know, possibly the most futile thing anyone ever does on the internet, but, you know. <laughs> Here's a long article, I didn't read it, so I will take the time to write a comment saying that I didn't read it because it was too long. Well, you know, it makes some people happy, I guess. Anyway, there is some evidence, according to studies, that reading on screens can be worse for comprehension than reading on paper. And there are some very interesting recent studies uh, also that if you take notes on a laptop in a lecture hall or in the classroom, then you're likely to understand less and remember less than if you're making notes by hand with a pen or pencil on paper, because there's something about the motor act of... It's partly the motor act of writing, people say, and then the people said also, if you're taking notes by hand, you can't literally transcribe everything that the person is saying. So you have to do some extra thinking to boil it down to the essentials of what the person has said, and that helps you remember it later. Whereas with a laptop, if you type fast, you can more or less write down everything they say, so there's, there's much less filtering going on in your mind. This is the theory anyway, so that's very interesting. The problem is, I think, from my point of view, that if all this tr is true, why are, there, why are there so many long articles on the internet now? In fact, it's a growing trend that there's very long essays being published on the internet only for online-only publications, like there's a magazine called Eon, and there's one called Matter, and these things have essays that last thousands of words, and um, there's a new word for these, long reads. I don't really like the word long reads, because I don't see what's wrong with the, the term essays. We don't call the film a long watch or a dinner, a long eat. Uh, but anyway, there are lots of these new magazine startups which are devoted to in-depth reportage or cheerfully non-topical discussions of ideas, and they're beautifully typeset. And this is an image of um, something I wrote for Eon magazine, just to give the idea of how nice it looks. I mean, it's interesting that they're trying to emulate the, the cleanness, really, of print. But it means it's nicer to read if you're reading on a laptop or a tablet or something. You might even say it's ideal for slow reading. So maybe the problem some of us have with reading a long article on the internet is not just because it's on the internet or even because it's on a screen, but maybe it's as simple as annoying website design where you have small fonts or nasty blinking adverts and there's always that terrible risk you might accidentally scroll down and start reading the comments when you didn't mean to, which usually leads to bad taste in the mouth. So this is why Eon and these other new magazines have very simple, clean designs. And, you know, a lot of people read them. So I'm not sure it really makes sense to say that we can't read anymore because of the internet. Otherwise, these new magazines wouldn't be doing such good business. And, of course, in the offline world, an awful lot of people are reading very, very long books. Harry Potter, Fifty Shades of Grey, Game of Thrones. I mean, these are like five, six hundred pages books. So if the internet had somehow destroyed the part of our brain that enabled us to read slowly and deeply, then uh, surely those authors wouldn't be making so much money. I guess. As an example of another fear about technology and language, Video games are sometimes said to harm literacy. There was a report of the International Literacy Study um, a few years ago, which said that England has plummeted from third to 19th in an international league table of children's literacy levels as pupils replace books with computer games. Well, 
this is a kind of paranoia that adults have about something they don't really understand. Um, and that video games must be terribly harmful because kids are obviously playing video games and not reading books. Um, except that a lot of video games require you to read quite a lot. Here's one. This is a game called Phoenix Wright, which is a, a sort of adventure logic puzzle solving game in which you play the part of the attorney, ace attorney Phoenix Wright, and on this image he's saying, until these questions are answered, I assert it's impossible for a fair ruling to be made. Which is actually quite a complex sentence to ask a young person to grasp and pass. And, you know, there are tens of thousands of words of th uh, in, in games like this. Um, and some games even make you write. You know, you have a map and you have to scribble on it and you have to... You have to read a lot of text and interpret things for clues. So again, I mean, if you're reading on a screen, then at least you're learning to read, and I don't see how that harms literacy either. It's possible, <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's possible that instead of these evil new technologies like video games and the internet destroying literacy, we're just seeing literacy move into these new areas that the guardians of old definitions of literacy don't really understand and currently fit into their old models. So it worries them. But it's not as if text is going away in video games or instant messaging or online forums. I mean, if you think about it, how many people around the world are now writing text every day because of the internet, because of SMS text messaging, compared to how many people were writing every day only 20 or 30 years ago? let alone hundreds of years ago, when literacy was the prerogative of the relatively rich. I would assume, I haven't actually seen any hard facts, but I, I find it hard to disbelieve that more people must be writing every day now, all over the world, than at any previous time in human history. Um, and at least some people understand this. There's a, a linguist in England called David Crystal, who seems to write about a book every three months, an extraordinary productive fellow. And you know, he's an academic linguist, so he knows what he's talking about. And he, he cited a study which found that actually use of text messaging on mobile phones by children was linked with literacy achievements. The more a child texted, the better their literacy scores. And the longer a child had owned a mobile phone, the better their scores. And David Crystal said, literacy is the ability to read and write. How do you improve literacy? By practice. Thank you. The more you practice, Crystal says, the better you'll be. And then along comes a technology which gives you more opportunity to practice reading and writing than anything you ever had before. He's still talking about the mobile phone. So <clears throat> there's a lot more long writing going on the internet. People are writing more on their phones and on the internet. But maybe what they're writing is just rubbish. Maybe that's the problem. That's what Robert McCrum thinks. He thinks it's all stuffed with grammatical violations and banality. Of course, not everyone on the internet is Shakespeare. But people use different registers according to whether they're using instant messaging chat, like Gmail chat, versus formal emails for work, versus writing blogs or comments on blogs versus Twitter, and they understand the difference between all these media. So lumping them all together as the internet and saying that's a thing that does violence to language is not really to understand all the different things that are going, that are going on. McCrum says blogs and emails contain very bad prose. Well, I feel sorry for the people who email him, because I, I get a lot of very well written emails from my friends. And, you know, there are a lot of very clever and good blogs as well as a, very, a lot of poor ones. And there's a lot of very good writing that happens only on the internet, such as that magazine Eon. So that's the kind of, that's the dark side of the internet, according to some people, which I don't really believe. You know, I think there's a lot of writing around, there's a lot of reading around, and like always, a lot of it is bad and some of it's very good, but I don't think the medium is really the key indicator of whether it's going to be good or bad. And so we come to the more celebratory part of my talk, which is to point out that, like any t new technology, the internet has afforded us a wealth of new metaphors and colorful terms that we can use in everyday life if we're careful and if we're not snobbish about it. Um, but it makes some people anxious. 
And a couple of months ago, the new editor of Gawker, which is a slangy American sort of gossipy website, he issued a memo to his writers saying that they weren't allowed to use things that are considered internet slang. Terms like derp, which apparently is something you say when you just think somebody said something stupid or something stupid has happened, you derp. Um, FTW, for the win, and amazeballs. Um, and the new editor said, you mustn't use any of these terms. Why? Because we want to sound like regular adult human beings. It's a strange thing to say. So if you use internet slang, you're not a regular adult human being, so either you're an irregular adult human being, you're kind of a weirdo, or you're a regular human being, but you're not an adult, so you're a teenager, and you know, we, we know that teenagers talk in ways we just don't understand, so we want to sound like regular adults. We're not allowed to use internet slang. Well, as it happens, I know adult human beings, quite regular ones, who use terms like WTF and LOL, not just in their writing, but sometimes in everyday conversation in a kind of ironic way, or just, you know, it's, it's another way to express ourselves. You might even sometimes say pwn, which is actually one of my favorite ones. It's, so, it's such fun to say pwn. Pwn originated as a typing mistake for own, because P is right next to O on the keyboard. But then people adopted it, and uh, it, it means now that I, I defeat you in a really humiliating way. I pwn you. So the other night, Holland really pwned Spain in the World Cup. Um, and that kind of defeat can even be called pwnage. So people, I mean, they develop new parts of speech out of these seeds. It's really interesting. And uh, so here's, here's a link from Zelda saying pwn. That's I just like that image. So yeah, I mean, the editor of Gorka, it's a problem if these kinds of words are overused in writing. But then it's a problem if any words are overused. If I overused the word plinth in my writing and used it like three times in every article, no matter what the subject was, then that would be a bit weird as well. So, I mean, overuse is one thing, but I, I don't think you can say a whole category of language is just out with the bounds of good behavior. So, and I think they can, these, these kind of slangy terms can make for a, you know, a nice informality of tone, depending on your audience, of course. Um, so the Gawker editor, uh, this is an example of stylistic status anxiety in this kind of new age with all these kind of registers, nobody quite knows how to pitch things. And of course, sometimes in life, it's sensible to be aware of the status that your language projects. So if you're writing a job application, for example, you wouldn't write, lol, I is amazeballs on your CV because it's just not appropriate for that context, but it might be perfectly appropriate <laughs> for an instant message or, you know, a text to a friend. Unless I suppose you're applying to be a blogger, then maybe lol eyes and balls would be the right kind of thing to do. Anyway, people get anxious about these words, and they also, uh, they get anxious about whether they get into dictionaries, because people have this idea that dictionary, once a word's in the dictionary, then it's, a, it's an official word, and the powers that be are somehow giving their imprimatur to it. Um, in 2010, the Oxford American Dictionary added some of these internet acronyms. My BFF just told me that TTYL is in the dictionary, LMAO, LMAO. I don't know if you actually need LMAO out there, but I quite like trying to. Uh, TTYL apparently is talk to you later, and BFF, of course, is best friend forever. But what was interesting about this was people were aghast. There was a news story on CNN which asked, but how much of a blowback will schools receive when students can defend Twitter language? not to mention slang like lipstick lesbian, tramp stamp, and bromance in their essays. And those are some really interesting examples, because lipstick lesbian, tramp stamp, and bromance, they're kind of slangy, or they start off as slang, but they're certain, I don't think they're, they originated on the internet, as far as I know. And I've seen them used, pretty much all of them, I think, in the New Yorker and very high status print magazines like that. So again, that you're kind of conflating the kind of state perceived low status of internet acronyms, acronyms with other things you just think are kind of unclassy without actually thinking through where they come from and what, what they're used for. So while we're celebrating internet slang, um, it's as well to be careful about calling some things internet slang when they didn't originate on the internet. This is quite a controversial example, but OMG, meaning oh my god, some people say that started on 
new Usenet groups in the 80s, although there is this rather fascinating letter um, from Lord Fisher to Winston Churchill in 1917, and you can see where I've circled a bit down the bottom in red, if you can see that. I hear that a new order of knighthood is on the tapis. OMG! And then he explains it in brackets, oh my god, shower it on the Admiralty. <laughs> so that's at least one early example, and they certainly did have, didn't have the internet back then. Um, what about WTF? This is another dodgy example because the acronym WTF occurs in printed books and magazines in the 70s if you do a Google book search for it. So that predates public Usenet groups. But nobody knows whether all of those examples are WTF meaning what the fuck, or whether they're referring to an organization that was founded in the 70s called the World Taekwondo Federation. WTF, it's the World Taekwondo Federation. Uh, another of my favorite ones is fail. Ah, that was a fail, what an epic fail. You'll see that people saying fail to mean failure, or just that is really rubbish. Uh, the usual story is that this comes from a video game, a Japanese video game that came out in 1998 called Blazing Star. And it had this kind of badly translated Japlish text. And uh, when you lost your life, it said, you fail it. Your skill is not enough. See you next time. Bye bye. <laughs> and so the story is that people started saying, you fail it, in response to pretty much anything, uh, anything that went wrong. And then they started just using fail as shorthand for you fail it. Um, until the point where it's now used very widely outside online culture and in the so-called real world. Here's a guy protesting at the back of an American Senate hearing into the financial crisis. Just holding up a handwritten sign saying, fail. I like that. Um, but actually, the use of fail as a noun instead of failure is not web speak, and it's not even originally video game speak. It began about 400 years ago. If you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, um, sorry, those are quite small. Uh, but here, these are some of the examples. 1616, Shakespeare in The Winter's Tale. Dangers by his highness fail of issue may drop upon his kingdom. Um, and what we would say now is his failure of issue, but Shakespeare says fail for failure. And so does Burton in his diary, there is no fail of justice yet. And another 1678, there might be never any fail of generations. Unfortunately, the OED still says this meaning is obsolete, so it just needs to update its thing, saying this has come back. This is not a new internet usage. It's an ancient usage that Shakespeare uh, used, and so, you know, anti-internet slang snobs uh, know where to get off on that one. So when you look into the origins and things like this, you know, there's surprisingly little that actually did originate on the internet. I thought newbie had, but actually newbie was originally American military slang for a new recruit. But then things get adopted by the internet and changed. So newbie became noob, and that did happen online. And then noob could be written with two O's there, but on the third line you see it's written with two zeros. And that's an example of what's called lead speak when you change certain characters in a word to numbers because it's just kind of cool. Um, so web speak you, evolves away, even if it has offline origins like newbie does in the military, it can evolve away from them. And it can still evolve even if it started on the internet in the first place. So. We all know lol for laughing out loud, although some, famously the British Prime Minister used it to mean lots of love when he was texting a newspaper editor. Uh, but most of us know that it means laughing out loud. Um, and it's in the OED already, here we are, originally and chiefly in the language of electronic communications, ha ha. You've got to love the OED. It's used to draw attention to a joke or humorous statement or to express amusement. And their first citation is Fido News in 1989, lol, laughing out loud. And of course, once, once we had lol, we could have lol cats. 
And the use of language in long cut captions, I can has cheeseburger and all these kind of, they're all these things that look like grammatical mistakes, but there actually is a grammar to them. You can get the style of a long cut caption wrong. So that is becoming a whole dialect in itself really fascinatingly. And there is a very interesting academic paper by some linguists on that called I Can Has Language Play, the construction of language and identity in lol speak. So I recommend that as some light bedtime reading if you're interested. Um, and some terms change their meaning because of their adoption by the internet, trolling. <laughs> And uh, there's a very good book called Netymology by Tom Chatfield, who's a British writer. And I'm just going to read out an extract from what he says about trolling, because he does it very nicely. Trolling, he says, can be traced back to the old French verb troller, meaning to wander around aimlessly, a term that by around 1600 was being used in English to describe fishing from the back of a moving boat, and thus ranging freely across a body of water in the hope of attracting a bite. By the late 1960s, this kind of trolling had extended its metaphorical reach to people wandering around in the hope of a sexual encounter. And it was this sense of a seemingly casual, but in fact strategically targeted enticement that helped consolidate the use of trolling as a description of dubious online enticements. A professional troll is someone who posts material online from blogging or journalism to speeches and interviews that's expressly designed to provoke controversy and comment and to bait an audience into discussion. All this has also helped push the idea of trolling beyond strictly online activities, allowing the word increasingly to be used as a description of any form of cynical attention baiting. From self-publicists on TV news deliberately courting controversy to authors making outrageous claims. I don't know which authors he was thinking of there, but uh, probably some of them sometimes do. Anyway, that's from Tom Chatfield's Netymology, a book I recommend. Um, so, when speak evolves, it takes words, old words, um, and evolves their use. Um, it can also be visually creative. I mean, another term of web speak, ruffle, rolling on the floor laughing, all these terms for, you know, how you're laughing. I like say so, something's really not funny. Yeah, ruffle. But, yeah. That can be fun. Well, what's the next logical thing after ruffle? It's a ruffle cotter. And I've no idea why a ruffle should suddenly become a helicopter, but, you know, it, this is now a kind of meme in what's called ASCII art, because people make art much more complex than this, just out of the ASCII characters, which are letters and numbers and basic punctuation, as you see here in this picture of a helicopter. But um, Rothelcopter is, there's something like crazily, you know, exaggerated about going to all that trouble just to say, I'm really laughing. So I think it is basically also a really sarcastic image. You yeah, know, that's so funny. I went all the trouble to build you a helicopter out of ASCII characters. And, of course, another visually creative abs aspect of web, web speak, which seems you know, so common now, is emoticons, which are all familiar from, you know, texting, and they originated in online forums. Um, most online accounts say that the father of the emoticon is a guy called Scott Farleman, who is a computer scientist at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, he wrote this now legendary message on the 19th of September, 1982, on a computer science bulletin board. 1982. I proposed the following character sequence for joke markers. And there you see, standard smiley, read it sideways. Because people didn't know how to read sideways back then, isn't it? It's a, it's a skill we've all acquired in the decades since. Actually, it is probably more economical to mark things that are not jokes, given current trends. For this, use sad face. Cultural conservatives love to sneer at the use of emoticons like these, even though now they're quite old-fashioned. I can't wait to hear what people who rail against emoticons are going to say when they find out about emoji. Is this an emoji? You've probably all got emoji installed on your phones, and they're pretty much everywhere. They're on Android phones and iPhones, so they're now like another kind of vocabulary of expression that we can use creatively, such as this person, who is apparently telling the story of Miley Cyrus. 
Uh, I haven't actually spent the time to work out what this means and if it actually works as the story of Myriad Science, but, you know, it's a good effort, even if it doesn't really work. But, you know, the, you've got the musical instruments and, you know, you've got the faces with the, with the tongues coming out, that's very Miley Cyrus, and bikinis and, like, Edvard Munch's scream. Yeah, it all does make sense, next to piles of cash. It's brilliant, actually. <laughs> okay, so that's emoji. Um, and so what's true of emoji, I think, is true in general of internet language. The joy of web speak, subtitle of this talk, is that it provides us with new means of expression that we can use in daily life, which are things that we didn't previously have words for, or things that we couldn't express so succinctly, or things that give us a new kind of image for something. And so we come to the headline term, facepalm. I really like facepalm. It's a, it's a kind of way of indicating ironic despair. It's sometimes accompanied by this now classic image of Captain Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek. That is a classic facepalm. So something disappointing or embarrassing happens and you know, facepalm. The word facepalm, when you use it just as, a, as an interjection, it's just like a one-word sentence. It's interesting because you're typing out the word face palm, but nobody thinks that you're physically putting your face into your palm. The word does the, the word it does the work that the gesture would do if you were communicating face to face. So it's a kind of performative word, if you like. Um, it can also be a verb. Uh, you know, parts of speech can change, like pwn becomes ponage, and face palm can be now face palming, face palming. There was some celebrity who said something he shouldn't have done, and a Guardian commenter said, I imagine his lawyers were face palming in the next room listening to him. I just really like that image, you know, a kind of row of lawyers at a desk going, oh my god. You know. <laughs> of course, sometimes if something really bad happens, one face palm is not enough, so you might need a double face palm. And maybe for something really serious. or just to express your sadness about the sinfulness of humanity, you might need to try this one. <laughs> Jesus facepalm. So facepalm is one of these paradoxical words claiming that you're performing a physical action that you're not actually performing. Um, uh, there's another quite similar one, which, but it's a bit more violent. Head desk. And it's, it's interesting that these, there are very subtle distinctions of meaning between these two. So a head desk, I think, implies that you're so appalled by the stimulus, the kind of annoying, frustrating thing, that you're actually prepared to cause physical damage to yourself by smashing your forehead down into a desk. Um, because the, the pain would somehow come as a welcome distraction from whatever is, you know, annoyed you so much. Um, but with a face palm, you're just going, oh. It seems gentler, it seems sadder, perhaps even a little more sympathetic, a little more tolerant of human error. I don't know. So be careful. You know, think about whether you really want to say head desk or face palm. That's an important choice. So to sum up, I think it is time to sum up. Uh, these are just some of the ways I think that in far from destroying literacy, the internet and electronic media in general are enriching the language and offering us new ways to express ourselves. And in conclusion, I'm, I suggest that the next time you see someone moaning about how the internet is ruining our language and destroying literacy, and there will be a next time because people keep doing it, even though there's no evidence for it at all, but the next time somebody says the internet is ruining the English language or whatever language you think, the best response is one of pity rather than anger. In which case, <laughs> you might try Godzilla face palm, which is particularly nice because Godzilla is so powerful and he could just burn you to a crisp or just stamp on you, but instead, no, he just goes face palm because he, he, he'd prefer you to learn. You know, he doesn't want to kill you. Or if you don't want to go the Godzilla route, you could just use an emoji to signal your disapproval of these silly, paranoid theories about how the internet is harming language. And the emoji I would choose would be that one. <laughs> Face palm. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening. And uh, if there are any questions, then we're going to have some questions, aren't we? That's my Twitter and website and so forth.